So welcome everyone who are joining us now. Ukrainian Crisis Media Center continues the series of discussions on local elections 2020. This is traditionally organized within USA Dobre and decentralization bringing better results and efficiency. Since our previous discussion when we discussed amendments to the election legislation, a month has passed and we are planning to discuss the new important developments and decision made within this period which uh, both uh, uh, candidates and voters need to know 16 days before the election campaign starts. And let me introduce the speakers for today's discussion. Alexander Stelmach, uh, head of the Surface for Distribution of the State Registry of Voters. Mr. O Igor Obramyuk, Mr. Alexander Nelenka, Deputy Head of Secretariat of Ukrainian Association of Rayon and Oblast Councils. Olga Vazoyska, Head of NGO Obore. Uh, Olena Vuka, then the MP, uh, Roman Nichenko, head of uh, the programs for election uh, systems in Ukraine, and Andriy Mihera, deputy head of CEC in 2017 through 18. And we also are in connection with Mr. Logvin, head of the Association of uh, Cities, Mr. Alexander Salenta, expert of the Institute of Political Education, and Mr. Lazinski, the MP, is going to join us a bit later. Other MPs and representatives of the subcommittee on elections uh, uh, and representatives of the CEC, unfortunately, they said that they couldn't join us and participate in the discussion. For our voters, I would like to mention that uh, our event is broadcasted on Facebook pages of Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, Dobra Program and Decentralization page, and also on YouTube channels of Ukrainian Crisis, Ukrainian Crisis Media Center in Ukrainian and English. You can ask your questions to the broadcast on any of the platforms, so please make use of that opportunity. So we start the discussion. First, I would like us to discuss the aspect of establishing territorial election commissions. As of the uh, 11th of uh, August, 132 have been established. And my question to you is, what are the specific features for this decision and what was the impact of the amendments to the legislative, uh, to the elective uh, election legislation and the revised uh, administrative structure? So, Olena, maybe you could start. Good afternoon. Sure, this is a very complicated question because any processes, any election processes in 2020 are going to be challenging because we have the new election code and because we have the new administrative and territorial structure. Now, the key problems that we had when developing the territorial election commissions. There was mm, a little time to prepare and train members of the commission, so we had to quickly pick up among the candidates who we are already available and to come up with these applications. The main problem appeared uh, when submitting the applications to the CEC, and you know that there are two phases to the process. First, the commission set up by the CEC, oblast, rayon levels, uh, city lev uh, level and district uh, in, in the city of Kiev. They have been set up, as mentioned, by the CEC. Um, before the 10th of August. The main problem was about amending amendments to the election legislation and about uh, who the submission entities or subjects are. Actually, that includes rayon party organizations. And since we have the new administrative structure, new districts, there is the question about whether uh, rayon party organizations can apply based on the previous uh, principle. So, uh, whether they have the right to submit their applications and party organizations and parties didn't have enough time to reformat uh, the um, structures under the new, structure, uh, new administrative structure. So, there were clarifications to that uh, from the CEC. Eventually, the right of submission was 
commented on, and that included regional uh, oblast uh, organizations. So the process was not uh, disrupted. It happened as due by drawing, by setting up the commissions in accordance with the current legislation. What we see in the media about that, there are some, there is some dissatisfaction about uh, representation. Well, I wouldn't jump on that conclusion. Because first, it is important to analyze that. The election law does not include, does not stipulate equal representation for the region. It is uh, uh, at the party level that the representation should be equal uh, at the management positions. So we shouldn't confuse. If there is a high representation of a certain, a certain party in this region, then it is compensated in another region. I'm not read, ready to come up with the anal analytical data, and but I recommend the colleagues to first analyze the data and then uh, state that there are some violations. The second aspect is today that today it is the 20th and it is the last day to submit the documents for the second phase. Uh, and uh, this uh, is about uh, village uh, settlement and uh, district and cities commissions. For village and settlement, that is done by Rayon commissions, uh, 119 have been set, that have been set up by the CEC and district and cities, uh, that is done by the um, uh, respective local commissions. And that is going to be done before the 25th of August. And uh, uh, we hope that this process will continue as due and that the political parties will undertake the responsibility to organize this process and thus to organize the election process in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pani Olivne. Maybe someone who wants to add something to you, Pani Olivne. Якщо можна, я по цьому питанню додам декілька аспектів. Вони стосуються проблемної, як завжди, теми фінансування виборів. Відповідно, територіальні виборчі комісії, які сформовані центральною виборчою комісією, протягом серпня матимуть велику кількість завдань, і які потребують безперервної їх роботи. Це і те, про що говорила пані Олена, формування комісії територіального нижчого рівня, і також територіальна організація, тобто визначення меж багатомандатних округів до 30 серпня в громадах до 10 тисяч виборців. Проблема виникає у зв'язку з тим, що субвенції до місцевих бюджетів з державного бюджету виділені і на проведення організації виборчого процесу, оплату праці членів виборчих комісій, починаючи з 5 вересня. Тобто весь цей поза кампанійний, позавиборчий процес, який вимагає великої кількості людських ресурсів, кваліфікованих ресурсів, в тому числі технічних працівників, юристів, які потрібні для роботи виборчих комісій. До прикладу, комусь не сподобається рішення щодо формування ТВК комісіями, які створені Центральною виборчою комісією, або будуть оскарження рішень по формуванню багатомандатних виборчих округів. Для цього потрібно залучати кваліфікованих юристів. Територіальним виборчим комісіям у них коштів на це немає. Тобто, фактично, бюджет розраховувався і покриває видатки, які будуть понесені в межах організації проведення виборів, виключно починаючи з 5 вересня. Жодної ретроспективи фінансової of budget contributions, illegal uh, coverage and remuneration by uh, subjects of the election process. Let me also mention that there have been amendments to the criminal code and uh, now it is about bribery to uh, members of the commission, not only to voters that's included. So this uh, kind of shadow funding by headquarters of political parties and potential candidates can be seen as uh, a bribe to, for them to act or be inactive within their mandate. So the process of establishing territorial election commissions, and that was very challenging, and CEC undertook a lot of responsibility, and that was huge amount of work done within uh, the limited uh, time period. Uh, um, I 
believe there were more than 27,000 candidates. All of that proves that uh, we need to revise the approach and the um, timeline. Let me also emphasize that within this first uh, submissions, I will not speak about uh, statistics for representation of the parties. And so within the national uh, scale, uh, well, based on the information that has been uh, submitted, there is a problem about use of uh, a citizens' personal data without their agreement for them to be registered and submitted. Decisions for um, particular individuals has been already made by members of uh, the commissions because there is a simplified procedure where the person doesn't supply the application to work in the commission. So they these applications uh, should have been in place, but they are with the political party and they are not uh, added to the set to the package a batch of documents. And we know several cases where people were included into the commissions without being aware of that. And also, as far as I understand, there are more than 100 cases where so-called dead souls were proposed as the candidates for members uh, for the commissions. Maybe Alexander will say a couple of words about that. Uh, CEC has uh, access to uh, the registries, but uh, if uh, so, if uh, some members of the commissions are on the registry, but who uh, died over these five years, so I know that there are about 160 people already detected, those who are already dead, but they were included into the commission. So this kind of simplifications resulted in what we expected, actually, that without people being aware, they will be submitted by political parties. And also funding is not provided for this phase of the process, funding from the budget. And that may have a negative impact on the next phases, um, the second phase of establishment of the commissions and of election pressings. Alexander, would you like to add something to that? Well, speaking about dead souls, people who died, they were submitted as members of election commissions. And we know that there are 135 entries like that. They were timely detected and uh, not they were not included into the drawing process, and for that we use data of the registry as stipulated by the law. CEC can check information of those submissions for commission members uh, using data of the state registry. To add to that, uh, speaking about criminal record, we detected one person who was submitted by a member of Cherkasy Oblast Territorial Election Commission who in 2012 was uh, uh, accused of a crime of falsifying election documentation and uh, the election c uh, protocol, uh, results protocol. So this is a member of the commission who committed illegal, uh, who committed a crime, who entered uh, unreliable false information into the protocol. Happily, the political party that uh, submitted them, this is Sluhan Rodu, they responded uh, to this information in public space and they submitted um, another candidate, but this proves that we fail, we don't have a system for full-fledged verification. This is not the task of CEC to cross-check this information, but we need to think about that because that person was sentenced. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he had a prison sentence with a delay, but also uh, he is prohibited from uh, taking a um, public uh, positions and this period is still uh, ongoing. However, they still submitted and CEC registered this person. Dear colleagues, I would like to emphasize that this election process is no exception, meaning that the parliament just on the eve uh, made the decision to amend election rights. But let me also remind you that uh, just recently election system was changed, revised, and that's serious. And somehow we forget 
uh, about wo even watchdogs of the democracy that the election system cannot be changed. We were quite okay with that, but that's abnormal. You can go back to 2015, etc. Well, that's right, but we shouldn't look into the future. We should look uh, into the past. We need to think about the future to prevent that in the future. If we speak about how we are now going to hold these uh, local elections at the national level, there we should not forget about that the legislative basis that was set up uh, for the new territorial communities and rayons, uh, it is quite controversial, so to put it. Because uh, the legislator, when and determining uh, administrative centers and uh, boundaries of territories of new territorial communities somehow amended not the uh, main body of the law on local governance to say nothing about that we still don't have the law on territorial uh, structure but they made uh, uh, amendments uh, to the regulations on uh, ter on territorial uh, local government uh, so eventually, the state, represented by an executive authority, made uh, a decision uh, kind of uh, what uh, uh, communities can exist and which cannot. In particular, if you consider Article 140 on the right of voluntary um, amalgamation of territorial communities, somehow we forget about that and the law, uh, respective law. So this mechanism legally is a bit to put it mildly, ambiguous. And if now we take the election code, for example, if we consider setting up the uh, pressings at the level of uh, uh, for elections of oblast uh, councillors, you will see that uh, you will not be able to do that 100% in compliance with legislation. Because on the one hand, they liquidate and set up new rayons. And uh, on the other hand, in the legislation, we have those rudiments, like uh, cities of oblast or uh, rayon significance. So there may be quite significant problems uh, at the city level for rayon councils. And the general idea that there you need to take into account uh, uh, administrative and territorial structure and only if uh, there is this possibility. Speaking about territorial commissions, that is something that has recently happened. I disagree with the statement that uh, CEC has encountered the greatest dif difficulties ever when establishing the commissions. Let me remind you that in 2010, 26, uh, 2006, 2015, actually, you can go back to that and you'll see that the CEC then created much more territorial election commissions. We had more rayons and there were uh, all the significant cities. You can check. And the great problem is that the legal uh, clarity for establishing territorial commissions is complicated with the fact that the legislator, unfortunately, introduced amendments to the election code later. Then first activities to uh, establish, uh, to execute the parliamentary agreement uh, with the political party uh, was supposed to happen. So this is additional issue. To say nothing about the fact that unfortunately, counter to the Ukrainian legislation, part five of Article 36, where it is stipulated that all associations of citizens shall be equal to the law, here, legislator prefers parliamentary parties um, much more. Well, of course, they may have some preferences, but it is not too, not that too people become members of territorial committees uh, for uh, plus one for drawing. So I will even surprise you more that maybe even five people within territorial election commission, hypothetically, because the code prohibits a deputy uh, 
an MP group to sign more than one agreement with more than one political party. But one political party uh, can uh, sign any number of uh, the uh, factions or caucuses so they, uh, in, the, in the parliament. So it is quite possible that there are even five representatives in the commission from them. So if you consider the code, all of these aspects become obvious. And of course, there are a lot of other aspects which I'm going to speak about later. But if we speak about territorial commissions now, this is a very challenging topic, a simplification of election procedures. What that means? For territorial commissions, we have simplified that. Now members of election commissions are not supposed to submit their applications to CEC or to district commissions if we speak about uh, uh, village and settlement commissions. However, the law still has the provision where candidates for official observers must submit their applications. And that's absurd because uh, observers are supposed to su submit their applications, but not commission members. And uh, actually, it is about who's closer to, 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 to whom. So, like, you need to protect the observers, but not election commission members. And these uh, are signs, actually, where people didn't submit their applications to the commissions, but they uh, are included as candidates with the resolutions and decisions of CEC. We will see what hap will happen at the rayon level, and that's a significant problem. So, I believe that uh, it would be wrong to disregard that. Thank you, Andri. And Yuri, well, I wanted to switch to the next question, but now a short comment from you. Good afternoon. Today, I'm going to have more questions than answers, because actually parliamentary parties, as mentioned, they had actually collusion, everybody but for Hollis, they created a lot of nuisance for local governance, communities, and CC. Because revision of election rules and the system on the eve of elections made communities to significantly revise their pre-election Mm, activities and to uh, join very different negotiation formats. And now we had a meeting of regional uh, offices of the Ukrainian Association of Communities. I visited 16 regions and I should say that people are unhappy everywhere and there is quite a high level of tension because actually it would be it. it it was possible to avoid this problem. We could avoid that. You didn't need to partify the election system a month before the election campaign and to set up a number of other challenges. So, as Andri mentioned, us, the association, we are not okay with that and as well as other associations and experts, we spoke uh, in quite a loud voice, talking to the authorities about that that shouldn't be done. But uh, all parliamentary parties, but for Horace, didn't hear us. They decided that they can and uh, want to make that decision in order to create significant preferences for themselves, as mentioned by Andre, and to create significant problems for their communities. Speaking about other aspects, I will cover them later. But for the commission in the regions, they told me directly that now a very kind of uh, rudimental and conserved parties uh, are uh, playing their role and mm, an indirect sign of that is the that so problem maybe they didn't even check their candidates they were hurrying they because this is their business making 
And now these parties that are not going to participate in the election process where they just do business on that, they are now say, selling, trading uh, vacancies in those election commissions. So it is trade in not only the mandates, but also a trade in a lot of other important things, including the vacancies in the election commissions. And informally, we discussed it that we will probably recommend it to the communities to go to those who monitor this process, to Apora in particular, in order to register to document these cases, because now they speak about that directly and they can document those cases so that that business made of elections, we could that we could keep that under control and then based on the analysis uh, available to make amendments to the election legislation and that would uh, impede this business thank you and let me also mention no microphone no sound microphone is off Microphone is off. No microphone, no microphone. No sound. No sound, sorry. So now Mr. Solentai has joined us. And could you please share your opinion about elections in the 18 communities of Donetsk and Luhansk regions that have not yet been announced? I would like to continue where Igor stopped. Representatives of those uh, communities also actively insisted on uh, that we shouldn't allow for partisanization of elections in small communities, and now they suffer actually that as a result. Because from the legal point of view, uh, local military and civil uh, administration said that they cannot ensure safety and security for the elections. But that is undermined. Um, based on analysis of last year's processes, where two rounds of presidential elections and parliamentary elections were held there. So it was okay to do that three times uh, at the local community level, uh, but then it was about national elections. But now when it goes, uh, it is about uh, uh, local elections, it becomes insecure, unsafe. Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, there they recently uh, had local elections as well. So that's not only about national elections. And at the informal level, everybody realizes that this is because sociological surveys prove uh, that the results would be uh, poor for some political parties that support this idea that the election should not be held there. And there will be positive results for those parties that support the idea of the election. So it looks very much like manipulation, where it is politically reasonable they, they hold the elections, but where it is it may not be beneficial, they don't hold the elections. And there were some mechanisms or ways uh, to use that uh, uh, to block the elections in other regions, maybe they would have done that. And uh, this recent two days, I have been speaking, uh, talking to Zolote, Hirske, Shastya, Papas, Natrohizbenka communities, Petra Pavlivka, etc., all those communities that are close to the contact line, and uh, Severodonetsk, etc. And there is no discussion about not holding the elections, about that elections were not announced for uh, Luhansk or Donetsk Oblast uh, uh, councils. There, it there was a general level of understanding, and there um, people quite accept that. But they don't understand how come that new amalgamated communities are being set up. So it is about new configuration of administrative and territorial structure. However, this new configuration is not accompanied with local elections. 
for this new amalgamated communities uh, for village settlement and uh, municipal councils. And that refers not to all the communities, but only some of them. In Novai Darsk, that's okay, you can hold the elections there, but in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk and Shastya, uh, which are adjacent to that, that cannot be done. Even geographically, if you consider those com uh, communities where the elections are allowed and not allowed, it will look an, as an absurdity. Moreover, elections to Rayon councils were announced last week, and so all of these uh, communities uh, are in Shastya and Severodonetsk uh, rayons, and then it means that in some communities there will be elections within the same rayon, and maybe elections to Rayon councils if we still have Rayon councils, but what about the other communities? It looks this way that elections uh, are held for Rayon council, but not at the community level, and that happens at the same um, polling station. So why not use just another bulletin? And uh, uh, if none of the elections are held, then um, Rayon councils will be elected by fewer people than that are members of that rayon, then why not do that to Luhansk or Donetsk Oblast? So I rather supported the idea that we made a significant mistake at the level of CEC where the decision was made not to hold the elections for um, uh, some of the communities uh, in the controlled territories. Uh, that uh, they may refer to the distance to the contract line, but by the way, Mariupol is so close to the contract line and they are going to have no problem about that. And also the rayon factor. You know what I think about elections for rayon councils, but this is not the topic of our discussion. But there, the situation is twofold kind of uh, rayon. Uh, councils are okay, but elections for the uh, communities that are parts of those rayons are not there, they are not going to hold the elections. I believe that we need to very quickly correct that mistake because that uh, undermines the, uh, the concept of uh, uh, liberation, deoccupation, uh, independent, because then how do methods of the independent uh, Ukrainian state are different from uh, uh, Luhansk Donetsk people's uh, so called People's Republics? Because they actually they introduce much worse versions of civil and uh, military administrations, but anyway, uh, using the communities, managing, uh, uh, managing the communities using those administrations uh, that undermines the policy for regional and local development. Now I pass the floor to other speakers. Mr. Lohina, would you like to add something to that? Good afternoon, dear participants. Actually, I uh, quite agree with Mr. Solantai. And even if we consider the law of Ukraine on local governance in Ukraine, there it is stipulated and that uh, the mandate of a council or the head of the council can be withdrawn or um, uh, discontinued, but for that you need to set them up. So this is a quite strange solution. Maybe it is about a highly political interests which we do not see and understand very clearly. So I do believe that it is mandatory to hold elections in all communities. And if there are security issues, it is possible to suspend that in some uh, polling stations, but, in, uh, but elections need to be held everywhere uh, in the controlled territory of Ukraine. Because it seems that this kind of high political interests and high politicians, they become hostages of their decision. First, they reduce the barrier, the uh, threshold to 10,000 uh, voters. Then they understand that they won't like the results uh, of the elections, and they decided to, re to uh, resolve that by not holding the elections. Okay, maybe we have some alternative ideas among our speakers on that issue. Mr. Mihera, I agree with Alexander that this is a purely political decision, and I would not accuse the CEC only there. 
because uh, somebody submitted that uh, application and, and they need to be submitted by military and civil administrations and you know who appoints them and their managers. So when I worked in CEC in 2015, you remember it was so challenging that year and there were a lot of hostilities and the security situation was very challenging. But back then in Severodonetsk and in Lysychansk, uh, representative uh, local governance, uh, governments were elected. And I'm also surprised with the cynicism of the parliament, where in the resolution on the elections, they stipulate that uh, elections for members of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast Councils uh, cannot be held because it is not possible to ensure a joint representation of interests of all the communities that are parts of those oblasts. But how can you ensure a representation of joint interests of territorial communities in all the other 22 oblast councils because we have the proportional election system. So no representation of any communities is going to be expected in any at the oblast level. So if the cynical decisions are made, at least you need to come up with a more reasonable rationale for that because you cannot do that. And that will... Uh, really uh, be counter interests of uh, Ukraine, no matter who wins there, uh, opposite or Shari or European solidarity, but it doesn't matter. It's important that we ensure the right to local governance. For that, you, need, you have controlling authorities, local administrations that need to do their job if local councils uh, violate the constitution and the law. Thank you, Andriy. You uh, mentioned what I wanted to say because that's true that that's not the CEC initiative. We do believe in the association that that's a political decision and somehow our authorities, uh, mm, instead of supporting elections, they kind of do everything possible in order to make those elections tailor-made for their interests, to tailor them for their interests, not to hold the elections where it is possible to avoid holding the election. So they do a lot of things, but that is not about supporting the election process. And we are very much concerned about that because actually that can be seen as um, an uh, encroachment on local govern governance as a system. Maybe the authorities would like to have more convenient and uh, where they try to find ways, legal or illegal, public or not public, how to ensure their interests. And that's very concerning. So the situation in the regions is quite, uh, is where people are quite concerned about those decisions. Why the um, authorities want to control uh, local governments? Because we created sustainable communities where they need to have sustainable and uh, um, self uh, local government and now it is important to make it uh, to empower them by holding fair elections and uh, mention those discussions of the red zones and the quarantine lockdown and that maybe there will be no elections uh, even in those obvious so there is some reason to that so maybe there will be no discussions at all uh, in any of the oblasts let me comment on those 18 communities. First, we have a systemic problem there, and it is quite long-standing. In 2017, the new CEC, one of their first decisions was uh, to hold the elections in amalgamated territorial communities. And after several weeks, they excluded from that resolution the list of communities for Donetsk Oblast, for example. One of them was on the border with Dnipropetrovsk uh, Oblast. And the CEC that makes the decision now, they are a bit wise, wiser because uh, they um, uh, published, disclosed the letter from civil and uh, military administration explaining uh, the rationale for their decision making. Because really, they do not have the mandate to verify to the facts for security because this is not the responsibility, felt of responsibility of CEC. If you look at that table, 
where they just indicate the list of those districts and uh, the comment that in those districts it won't be possible to hold the elections, but there are no, uh, there is no um, substance to that, no documents uh, based on which they made that conclusion. Um, it is obvious that it is about political decision because uh, back in 2015 there was there were no hostilities in on the border with uh, the Dnipropetrovsk region that was motivated by uh, local and national uh, and political interests. So it happens today. So the question is whether we are going to go on with that so that in the next uh, years uh, we went back to those solutions or should we make a systemic decision to revise the very principle and the stakeholders who make the respective conclusions. Uh, military and civil administration has a conflict of interest when they submit these letters, because when they submit this letter to CEC that has no mandate to verify this information, it means that the administration has uh, all the power in those territories, um, depriving local governments um, of that. And so, de facto, they said uh, without any rationale, they uh, stipulate that it is not possible to hold the elections there. So uh, we believe that it is important to revise the criteria based on which the decision is made on that it will be not be possible to hold the elections and the subjects, the participants of decision making. It shouldn't be military civil administration. It should include uh, National Security Council, uh, Security and Defense Council, because there, if we doubt conclusions or decision making of some uh, officials of uh, military and civil administration, uh, the Security Council needs uh, to undertake the responsibility for m making the decision there. Speaking about COVID-19 and the pandemic and whether the elections will be held, maybe many of you know that we have two grounds for that. That is. Um, and the uh, martial law and the extraordinary situations that make it possible to uh, delay it, to postpone elections, but for a short period of time. At the national level, it is 30 days plus 30 days that it could be prolonged with. And uh, I believe, well, these are not uh, some sporadic statements, but there was the statement by the Prime Minister at one of pri press conferences. Recently, we heard that from the senatory and uh, national uh, senatory uh, physician. And we uh, need to understand that elections should be commented on by those who are responsible, not doctors, not uh, Minister of Health, not the Prime Minister, in the situation where there are only two legal grounds not to hold the elections. So we should avoid the uh, that in the situation where there is already disbalance and demoralization of potential stakeholders in the election process, and the parties, the candidates who see the problems and contradictions in the election code, where there are new requirements to them, where legal, when they need to look for legal uh, entities, political parties to participate, and now they are disoriented even about whether the elections are going to take place, even though there are no preconditions like that. Um, despite the lockdown situation since the 12th of March, um, the, uh, there was no extraordinary situation announced. And when they refer to Polish practices, that's a very uh, poor idea, because Poland didn't pass uh, their test for democracy in the situation of the pandemic and the elections, because the pandemic was used in order to make use of some electoral opportunities of a specific political group, so they didn't want to postpone. And the elections, Poland made so many mistakes regarding um, the decisions on how to hold those elections. They used mail, uh, remote voting, um, etc. So definitely we should not follow the example of Poland when we discuss uh, how we organize elections in the context of the lockdown. Thank you for this comment on COVID-19. And uh, the floor is yours now. I just wanted to comment briefly on this security factor. 
I believe that this is really abuse. It is like deja vu for me. When we had the discussion on prospective plans, all the associations supported the idea on that in Hinichesk Rayon, a separate Shashlivtseva uh, uh, amalgamated territorial community was set up, but they said that there is uh, some security problem. Um, security service said that they are not included into the process, so there should be some algorithm either involving the Security Council or whatever, because uh, it is obvious that in a state um, at war, the authorities will abuse this security uh, aspect. And now we, uh, we see that amendments to the Constitution are being prepared, and again, and there will, it will affect uh, provisions on the security of the state. and. Uh, I believe that we need to develop some um, transparent mechanisms and algorithms uh, for decision making on whether there are security risks or not and what they are, because I believe that abuse in that case is very obvious. Uh, this is political uh, reasons and interests uh, where they disguise, uh, disguise that with security. And what is the final term for amendments of uh, making amendments to the decision of CEC on uh, elections in those territories? Well, obviously, the deadlines are now in the past, because if we speak about Article 194, Part 8 of the Election Code, the first phase of the election uh, and uh, the planned elections, uh, there the deadline is the 26 of July. If it is uh, Article 195, then it is the 25th of August. But recently, the uh, chair of CEC in his interview, unfortunately, he's not with us, but I would like to quote him. And the security situation may change, and if until the election process is launched, we receive uh, the conclusions of Donetsk and Luhansk military state administrations that it is possible to hold the elections in their territories, uh, uh, then we can have hold the elections there even on the 25th of October. I have a, a significant question there. How is that possible? Because the process has been started, uh, even though the election campaign will start on the 5th of September, but the territorial election commissions have been set up and the process is ongoing. So if we speak about the calendar plan for the election process, that would be a challenge. So in order to implement that scenario, the legislator needs to come up with uh, a separate legislative initiatives and amendments. Elena and colleagues, this letter and this interview of CEC, well, actual representatives of the communities, they see that as a straw that may save them, as if this is a hope for them and to uh, hold the elections. And you are right saying that CEC didn't make that decision. That is the impact of the presidential office and those who coordinate political processes in the president's party. But anyway, how would it be possible to do that before the 25th of October? The only option where it may happen, this is the period of establishing the current territorial election commissions at the level, I mean, Rayon uh, territorial election commissions for village and settlement um, councils. Well, the village commissions have been set up already, and uh, there have been applications for those commissions. So, actually, we uh, it is only possible to do that within the next couple of days. I, and, and if that's not done, you're right, it cannot be done before the 25th of October. I, speaking subjectively, the point of no return for holding the elections in those specific communities where it is deemed that it is it won't be possible to hold that uh, elections well take it into account the cec on one day adopted two resolutions first on announcing the elections first uh, local elections and the second on that it's not possible to hold the election. So with one resolution, they uh, announced the elections in Severodonetsk, in Lysychansk and other cities, while with another resolution, they deem it impossible to hold uh, the elections in the respective territories. And my idea is, 
that even if you consider the fact that for rayon commissions they have already been set up for village and settlement uh, ones it is the process is ongoing so even there according to the code now later than on the 6th of september it will be necessary to set up territorial election district so if unless till the 6th of september no decision is made on severodonetsk lisichansk etc i believe that after the 6th of September, the process will be irreversible because then nobody will be able to catch up. A very short con uh, comment. You know, the parliament can do everything. Parliamentary oversight, well, I do hope that part of MPs will make that opportunity to address military and civil administrations for them to properly substantiate their letters and to think about the procedure that could be applied. Let me go back to 2015, where two election processes were, uh, were uh, disrupted. You remember that uh, the parliament made the decision uh, on the 25th of October and the voting was on the 15th of uh, November. I agree with Mr. Uh, Mahira that 6th of September September is going to be the official, the formal deadline, and uh, much will depend on whether the respective decision is made and then the calendar plan will be implemented as due or the elections need to be postponed. But I would uh, invite members of those territorial communities not to see the situation as if uh, that if they don't have that elections on the 25th, then they are not going to have full-fledged uh, uh, local governance for the next uh, five years. I would suggest that they keep in touch with their MPs. It is a pity that this local situation was uh, made use of to increase the potential uh, contradictions, controversies, and uh, tension at the political level, because it looks now as if uh, Ukraine is not a, democr a democracy, because the decision is not made to support constitutional rights of citizens, but to resolve some short-term political interests. So I would invite MPs from all factions to consider this uh, situation uh, and to make the respective decision, maybe extraordinary decision, uh, to hold extraordinary elections in November or to think about a new election process uh, this year in the new territorial community because we cannot postpone the elections for five years um, because uh, this decision was made we, and this decision looks controversial to 90% of, of expert community. Uh, okay, I will pass this good positive message to the communities. Thank you for this detailed explanation and comment on that. And let's move on to continue with the topic of uh, election rights. What about changing election addresses at these elections? Currently, voters can vote at the actual place of residence. And now the procedure is very straightforward. I could also check how it works. And that is very easy. However, with this simplification, we see that there are already some cases of abuse. And that was in the media, and that was mentioned by experts, and the CEC responded to that. So then, I have a question to Alexander Stelmach. Maybe you could tell us about the statistical information regarding changing election addresses, and who is monitoring and controlling reliability of data submitted to the state registry of voters. On the 1st of July this year, since that day, our voters can change their election addresses and do that not only for national elections, but also when they vote at local elections. Regarding statistics, as of now, starting from the 1st of July this year, almost 9,000 citizens have used that, made use of that right. 
of those cases, it is where they uh, change their address for their actual residence address. And 7% it is where the voters change their election address and they go back to the registered place of residence or where they come up with an election address without that kind of substantiation. You know that those voters who have the respective stamp in their passport, they never were included into the list of voters. They could not vote, and now they have this opportunity. So 174 voters used made use of that right, and with that stamp in the passport, they still uh, but will participate in the elections. That is a new mechanism. It is being applied for the first time. And apart from the fact that voters can come vis physically to the registry offices, they can also do that in a remote way. But CEC from the very first days when they started changing election addresses, they could see potential possibility for illegal change of, uh, of election addresses. They contacted the national police, so it is too early to say if it was about some infringements, and, um, but based on the discussions with the national police, the uh, information will be disclosed. A couple of words about that, because international community uh, at the level of the international community stipulate this right to change their voting address as one of the main positive achievements and based on the feedback about three million voters will now have the opportunity to vote where they live that includes idps and labor migrants people without registration and sure, I believe we should not think about that. Well, there are some cases of uh, where they attempted to manipulate that. We should not see that as a systemic failure. This is one of elements and mechanisms that would have been used even if we didn't have this new system introduced. Another issue that we need to raise to our society is that uh, we do not see that a lot of people would like to change their voting addresses. We could see, based on examples of last year's presidential and parliamentary elections, where there was also the opportunity to change the address, the procedure was a bit more uh, complicated, but not too complicated, especially for IDPs. Back then, we didn't see significant figures either. We could see a lot of figures in offices of the state registry of voters, but in the last days uh, before the elections, we will also see that. However, um, the issue is that uh, the it is about that now a lot of people can vote where they live, but unfortunately, now we don't see a high level of interest. So it is, maybe it is about the time factor, because uh, the decision applies not only to these elections, maybe we will see uh, what happens in a couple of years, but this is the situation now. Igor? All in all, this provision, I believe, needs to be seen as a positive decision. People need to have the opportunity to make use of their election rights no matter what their what stamps they have in their passport but now we see here signals especially from uh, communities located near larger cities they are a bit apprehensive because there it is possible to significantly change results of elections and this process can last until the 10th of september so the fact that they are close to large cities may affect decision making in their communities that's what they are apprehensive of so it is too early to say how many people and for what purpose will make use of those uh, op of that opportunity, but now smaller uh, communities adjacent to cities, they are a bit concerned about that because you understand that for the period of elections, it is possible to uh, move uh, 
couple of hundreds or thousands of voters from the city to those communities. And with that, it is possible to significantly change the result of elections in smaller communities. If there is this risk, could you share how it is possible to now prevent those um, infringements? Um, I would like to support the procedure. I'm grateful to State Registry and to Alexander for uh, daily disclosing statistical data that makes it possible for, uh, that uh, deprives uh, the politicians of the opportunity to lie to us. Because I do believe that the um, election right is the priority. If we have political parties that trade in quotas or vacancies in the commissions, it was officially stated, and that's enough for law enforcement authorities to respond. So that is not the reason to uh, cancel political parties. And uh, also, since we have uh, a small number of attempts to abuse the right to change the address uh, for smaller communities where there is uh, expensive uh, land for Kyiv, uh, uh, Oblast, for example, that's uh, unprecedented because there we also could see a significant increase in the number of voters, but that was about registration. People were registered in the apartments, and that is also um, a known fact. Uh, and uh, the Minister of Interior and Law Enforcement agencies, they conducted uh, investigations into those facts, and we would like to see uh, results of those investigations, because discrediting the right of a citizen not to be limited by the stamp, uh, stamp in their passport, not to limit their, polit their um, political and election rights, that would be too much to limit their rights. So I would like to emphasize that we try to respond to even some individual cases. We know about some of them. They are already available to the Department for Protection of Rights of Interests of the State and the Public of the National Police. They directly deal with the elections. And I really hope that um, factors already available, some audio recordings, that they will be used within that uh, uh, criminal litigation uh, or uh, criminal proceeding on those cases of abuse. But they will multiply if there will be no response to that. Yesterday there was a meeting in the Ministry of Interior with participation of the Minister of Akav, uh, head of uh, the Commission, um, Mr. Didenka, uh, heads of legal departments, head of uh, the National Police, and they discussed these facts. And they also stipulated that one of the ways to respond to that is revising Article 158 of the Criminal Code. We have prepared an amended text and we submitted that to the Parliament. Hopefully they will hear that because there in that article it is stipulated uh, uh, the fact of submitting underlevel information about elections uh, to the registry. And uh, that uh, is the ground for criminal proceeding and uh, after 25th of uh, uh, October it can be requalified uh, as um, under Article 69. So it's possible already to amend uh, that uh, provision and to add the part there where it is stipulated that uh, if a voter submits unreliable information about him or herself, they also are covered by the article. And sometimes we focus on a problem that does not really uh, impact uh, the result, uh, outcome of elections, at least at the national level, and the progress that we have. Somehow we uh, destructively see and that uh, based on uh, just a couple of cases. This is uh, based on the documents of the Council of Europe on the European uh, region, where it is stipulated that IDPs and those people who live not at the place of their registration, globally speaking, in some countries, they can uh, even foreigners can vote at local elections, but they cannot vote um, at uh, 
and the national elections, because if we speak about roads or sewage, that is of importance for them. If they live in that community, if they pay taxes, um, and uh, they are, uh, even though they're citizens of other states, well, we don't support those liberal approaches because we have uh, this factor of the Russian aggression and the interference into Ukrainian elections, but still we try and we invite you to avoid political discussions if it is really a progressive decision. Uh, let me also mention that MP Mr. Wazinski has joined us, so now Olena and then probably Roman if you have something to add. I'm not that optimistic as my colleagues are. Let me explain why. Our important achievement is that we liberalize the election legislation to protect uh, electi election rights, both active and passive, and that's true. But let's divide that into two parts. If we speak about election rights at parliamentary or presidential elections, that's one thing, and there you really we really need to be more democratic and liberal. But if we speak about local elections, we need to keep in mind that we have Article 140 of the Constitution, where uh, local government, uh, government is the right of residents of respective territories to influence decision-making at the local level. In working groups, we had a lot of discussions on these provisions that we're discussing now. And the position of some experts was that we shouldn't withdraw uh, the provision on motivated application. So if there is a motivated application, as it was previously uh, stipulated in the election legislation, then we would not have uh, issues there. According to Article 7 of the Election Code of Ukraine, election rights are clearly stipulated with the Election Code. So if I reside in a village, I have the right to vote for the village had village council for a rayon and the oblast council the right to abuse as we can see based on the examples in odessa region that's not just about violation of the criminal code that's not just about criminal proceedings that is an encroachment on uh, foundations of local governance, because those people who come to vote there, they will be subjects uh, that will uh, set up the structure of uh, the local government to be, and that is more important than election rights of an individual. We need to find the balance between election rights of citizens of Ukraine and members of territorial communities, if we speak about local governance, and the right uh, to local governance, and that's an open discussion. Thank you. If I may, actually, that's true, that initially there was the provision that when you change the election address, you need to come up with some motivation. However, let me mention that more potential abuses happened when the voters did submit those documents. So I wouldn't say that if we go back to those motivational documents, that the situation will be better. That's not quite so. The situation will be worse, I would say, because then the uh, document management uh, uh, clerk will be responsible for that. That uh, it will be kind of his or her responsibility to check all the signatures and to cross-check documents. So they will accuse the clerks, but the problem will still be there. So we definitely need to move on, and it looks a bit strange that someone is a member of a community, a voter, but the registry of territorial community doesn't include information and entry on that person. That's abnormal. It happens so that well, election rights of those people are protected, but in registries there is no information about those people. I, need to, I believe we need some progress there. And now another problem is that the state registry of voters, data of the registry, are used not only for elections, but since we don't have registration for those voters who live in temporarily occupied territory state, uh, migration service lost it uh, in the context of the aggression because it was on paper. So the state registry of voters is very often the only source of information that proves that a citizen uh, is a citizen of Ukraine. And uh, 
form uh, we have also a number of applications from voters about where they are in the registries and these documents are uh, used by sms to register passport documents and now uh, it appears that uh, well previously it was about registered place of residence and now in some cases it will be election address so even for idps they kind of cannot prove their registered address. Again, I mean, we need to have a comprehensive approach to this issue and we need to move on. Those need to be residents of the communities and those registered there. But uh, the change of address, is it a temporary phenomenon or it will stay for the next elections? It is not temporary. It will stay until the voter changes it or somehow the registry receives information or update about that the register uh, the voter registered another residential address or something and uh, it wouldn't be right to say that it only can happen until the tenth. it will be uh, uh, on the ongoing the process but only in the election period and within the five days of the uh, election campaign or election process and for those territories where elections are not uh, going to be held the um, people can also change their election address so it is not limited in time or geographically and uh, but you can do that only once a year I suggest that we pass the floor to Raman now, and then I will add to that. So, Raman, if you have something to add to that. Good afternoon. I'm not going to reiterate. Uh, a lot of procedural aspects have been discussed already. But here, I would like to mention something about liability for violations and what we should emphasize there. Because there is the procedure about 80 days left before elections and now amending or revising that procedure it wouldn't be reasonable as well as as so we need to speak about mitigating the risks about a week ago one of my acquaintances was going to be a candidate for one of the communities he tried to uh, use uh, this re-registration right and uh, he doesn't live in that community he has and nothing to do with that. He could never prove that he has any link to that community and he re-registered and now uh, they are going to uh, vote for this acquaintance of mine. So definitely there are positive aspects to that, but there are also risks and we need to focus now on liability for violations there. And we have a very clear provision of the criminal code, Article 158, that stipulates that if uh, intentionally voters submit false information to the registry, the sentence could be two to four years in prison. If it is false information as uh, collusion by a group of individuals, if it is organized, and that is something where we need to uh, focus, uh, the law enforcement agencies need to focus on these groups, group re-registrations, these um, signs of abuse. Again, that is from seven to 10 years in prison if they submit false information and that is organized by a group of individuals. So I would like to say that now participants of the political process and citizens they need to con to be watchdogs they, they need to monitor this process as any trends that may result in abuse if there will there are group re-registrations of strangers there probably it is also important to organize awareness raising campaigns even though i understand how little time is left and the resource and the uh, message about criminal liability needs to be uh, conveyed even though we have uh, very limited resources but if we speak about change of election addresses we understand the bottlenecks even though there are uh, prospective uh, positive aspects and so now we need to be watchdogs all of us the ukrainians and uh, uh, where there are some violations it is important to investigate that and i really hope that in that election process 
if uh, this is these facts are registered hopefully there will be a liability people will be brought to justice because impunity results in um, uncontrolled violations and that is the worst scenario so if we do not prove if we do not bring um, to justice perpetrators who commit this kind of violations individually or massively so andre and let's move on i am also one of those who are quite skeptical about that reform you remember the talk in 2015 partially i'm also responsible as a member of the commission for that so we could discuss if it was fair what happened there but you remember that in 2015 and the uh, elections were held by the territorial commission and the residential housing code and the uh, resolutions of the ukrainian soviet republic on uh, registration at the place of residence they are still in uh, they're still valid and uh, then the cec went to law enforcement agencies and it was obvious that they kind of they were reluctant to investigate into that now if this provision is going to be operational well both the mps who voted for that and representatives of the civil uh, society you will be politically and uh, civilly liability for legalizing a way to change the election address and interfere into local governance because the previous mechanism to submit a motivated application also included submission of documents there was a way to um, verify this information submission of uh, unreliable information that could uh, uh, trigger a criminal proceeding and that could be result in uh, some punity so now and uh, there are no prospects for those uh, criminal um, provisions because uh, uh, proceedings uh, because the voter just uh, comes and says i live here make it possible for me no criminal um, proceedings are possible and no amendments to the criminal code to articles 157 158 there it is about a special subject special entity those who submit information to the state registry of voters and this is done by uh, institutions and officials and again if we amend article 158 of the criminal code this uh, will only apply as linked to the election code in the election code there is the mechanism where the voter submits an application without any rational without any documents and that's it so we need to admit that this will go counter the positive interest that will not be for the benefit of the elections and now the right to vote the right to be a, a candidate it is not absolute uh, it is only implemented in a specific way to ensure the same rights for other citizens to ensure equal election rights to uh, support local uh, government and the right of local communities to that so it cannot exist individually i cannot come and vote on monday i can only do that on sunday within a particular time period i cannot Mm, apply to be a candidate uh, uh, at any time it is regulated by the election code so let's be frank very briefly on that frankly speaking i'm a bit concerned about retrograde approaches to adequate changes in the same way in 2015 the same people said that idps should not vote that they should be the resource to go back to occupied territories where in within the minsk uh, process uh, elections will be held there let's not cheat uh, um, uh, so officers of state registry will not be able to check uh, or verify any document they don't have mandate for that otherwise it is like civil and uh, uh, military administrations who, who submit those letters but where there are some political uh, condition uh, even though cc understands that there is uh, there are political interests uh, they anyway have to accept that previously uh, some political uh, forces try to motivate voters 
Young Voters. На президентських і парламентських виборах біля відділів ведення на вулицях стояли точки, де можна було отримати угоду, оренди. Ми розуміємо, що форма цих угод є дуже специфічна. Ми розуміємо, наскільки ринок оренди в Києві є тіньовим і таке інше і тому подібне. Тому, насправді, питання, якщо ми хочемо мотивовану заяву і документи, ми маємо дати інструмент відділу ведення реєстру для перевірки цих документів. В іншому випадку це не має жодного сенсу. В той же час ми перешкоджаємо реалізації виборчих прав громадянам, які проживають в цій громаді. І от, пане Романе, я до вас зараз роблю заклик публічний, будь ласка, надайте мені інформацію про цього виборця, який безпідставно звернувся і змінив виборчу адресу. Тому що ці одиничні історії станом на зараз є критичними. Для того, щоб не створювати перепони для реалізації виборчих прав громадян, які проживають в цих громадах, є або переселенцями, або належать до мобільних мігрантів, людей, які десятиліттями живуть в громаді, але не мають реєстрації, бо не мають власного житла. Цю дискусію ми можемо продовжити дуже довго. Я особисто готова брати відповідальність за ці рішення, якщо пан Магера хоче. Але я пам'ятаю, як ВПО також були поза процесом, і їх не можна було давати право голосувати в громадах, де вони проживають вже шостий рік. Тому я би просила просто е- мову ворожнечі не використовувати проти власних громадян і мислити більш глобально в системі е- реалізації е- прав людин. Колеги, дякую. Пропоную завершувати цю дискусію стосовно цього питання, адже у нас ще попереду багато е, і обмаль часу, і багато інших питань, які турбують наших глядачів. Е, зокрема, пропоную обговорити наступним те, е, чому деякі місцеві вибори будуть першими, а деякі черговими. І, е, ну, фактично, нагадаю, що 15 липня парламент призначив чергові вибори депутатів місцевих рад і сільських селищних міських голів е, – Тобто це чергові вибори, водночас, не водночас, а у свою чергу 8 серпня Центральна виборча комісія призначила CEC announced first elections for and on the 14th of August first elections to rayon councils were announced. So why the necessity to hold these first elections in amalgamated communities. Uh, what is the effect of that and what's the difference between the two types of elections? Alexander has not yet um, spoken up and Mr. Luhinov, maybe you could start with that discussion. Узагальнить, мабуть, ситуацію, бо дійсно в нас якось з наближенням кожних виборів держава входить у ситуацію проблемних питань, які іноді виходять у вуличні протести. 2004 рік, ми маємо революції гідності зараз у Білорусі, і фактично це є суспільно небезпечні речі, про які ми інколи будемо говорити, і законодавець фактично підводить просте населення, і навіть членів тих комісій, про що ми говорили, яких навіть подають без їх відома в ці комісії. Я, мабуть, акцентував би увагу зараз також на виборах, які признають. So I would like to focus on the elections for rayon and oblast councils because here in the association has a lot of questions about representation. Let me mention an example of the uh, oblast centers and that are also rayon centers and uh, three fifths of the MPs will definitely be from the oblast center. That does not really correspond to uh, recommendations opinion of the Venice Commission where they recommend that there should be 10% of variations. So I would also like to emphasize, well, when I'm speaking about that, that the legislator, when uh, just on the eve of elections day, when they cho- change rules of the game, that is the situation where law enforcement agencies should not attack uh, protesters, but they should imp- influence the situation there in the period of uh, the election process and voting. And uh, thus, as Andri mentioned, 
Um, sometimes there is political will to investigate criminal cases. Some are not investigated for five years. And uh, I know about the case where they um, forged protocols. So I would like to avoid the situation where the election commissions where there are now people, representatives that may, that are delegated there in order to distort um, voting results. I would also like to emphasize that uh, we can change something in Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, those 18 communities that where elections have not been announced, they should be held there because otherwise uh, the situation is such that uh, there are elections for rayon councils but not for communities. Another thing that is very important, I believe, and there's elections for oblast councils where councillors of Donetsk and Luhansk uh, oblasts, they have been in this position for more than 10 years. Sooner or later, that should be addressed. And we receive a lot of applications back uh, from 2015 on what to do about that. So they, we need some legislative framework for that. Thank you, Alexander. Mr. Loginov, would you like to comment on the first and planned elections? I can, but I believe you need to uh, address this question to the Ministry of uh, Communities and Territories, why some elections are first ones and one are planned. Well, look, 90% of decisions of the parliament are the initiatives of the Ministry of Regional Development. And this is kind of the key ministry for the local governance reform. So all initiatives are supported by the parliament. And uh, you can use pros and cons about why in some communities those could be planned elections, but in, for some it is first elections. But I understand that uh, all in all the decision was made to that well, the administrative and territorial uh, structure was changed. There are new communities, so somehow they believe that these are new communities uh, and the new first elections. But this is open uh, to discussion. And all in all, there should be a specific law to set the procedures, the parties, the timeline, and, but uh, here we all have, uh, have that all in transitional and final provisions, and that's wrong because that was dying in, done in a hasty way, and I believe this is why this category is. Thank you, Olena. I would like to mention that the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine adequately, in line with the Constitution, made the decision on announcing uh, the planned elections. Because at that moment, there was no decision on liquidation and establishment of rayons. They could not do anything else, so that's adequate. So now we are going to have planned elections for oblast councils. That's obvious why, because we, there were no changes uh, there. This will be first elections for rayon councils, and that's obvious that that's about territorial and administrative structure. 136 have been created, so these are the first elections for rayon councils. And for the basic level, there was an expert discussion on why uh, first elections are uh, announced uh, at all the day grassroots level uh, everywhere. And the position of the Ministry of Region was uh, mentioned by Mr. Logvinov. New administrative centers, new rayons, that's why first elections. But that's obvious. Logically, it is difficult to understand why Ujarat that didn't change its administrative structure, why they are going to have first elections now. That's an expert discussion. 
and we have Article 288 of the Election Code, which I am going to quote now. First elections of uh, councillors of uh, uh, village settlement and uh, municipal com communities are uh, announced if there are changes in administrative and territorial uh, structure as a re uh, resulting in new local governments. So according to the Constitution, uh, the administrative and uh, territorial structure may only cha be changed with the law of Ukraine, so it is open to discussion. Whether first or planned elections, um, well, for the calendar, a calendar plan, there is only one difference between them. This is the date for announcing first or planned elections. If we speak about planned elections, according to the current legislation, they were supposed to be held before the 26th of uh, and July and first till the 25th of August. Uh, the legislator uh, implement, announced parallel uh, procedures, so the process, the procedure is going to happen in a parallel way, so the voters will not uh, notice, perceive any changes. Uh, or any differences there. So I, I believe that the issue is different. If the legislator defines uh, first elections as such, if that's going to be uh, grounds for appealing against them, will there be the grounds for appealing? I'd like to emphasize that how Constitutional is that that on the 25th of October, any other elections but for um, planned elections are held. So uh, Article 141 of the Constitution stipulates uh, when uh, planned elections are held. I believe that uh, it is an outstanding issue. Just um, for us to think about that. So maybe the, um, one day the Constitutional Court will make a clear decision on whether uh, on the day of planned elections it is possible to hold uh, any other types of elections. And I don't know if we can touch upon that issue, but I am not sure that that was an adequate decision of the legislator to set up all the territorial election commissions. That is included in pr final provisions of the law. And imagine that situation. Uh, oblasts are the same. So why re uh, oblast regional commissions were set up? And I don't understand the logic of CEC when they set them up with the uh, including the word territorial into their name. Because territorial, if you speak about uh, mm, about uh, uh, various levels of commissions. Well, we don't say S Kiev Municipal City Council. We call it uh, uh, Kiev Municipal State Administration. So you understand what I mean, I guess. So new um, um, stamps, new uh, letterheads um, will be required. So I believe it was not reasonable. And we have another outstanding issue. I thought that the Association of Ukrainian Cities will comment on that, but traditionally I address this question to them. We still have mm, the outstanding issue of uh, announcing first elections uh, in the city of Kyiv, because the specific feature of the election code, it is uh, Article 194, three, uh, seven, three. And that uh, way it is stipulated that if uh, rayons are established, uh, uh, elections are going to take place. The story, mm, what happens in Kyiv, it is a long-term process. You remember in 2015, rayon councils were set up. Uh, that was a resolution uh, on managing uh, rayon uh, districts in the city of Kyiv. Then CEC announced elections, but the district administrative court suspended that process. Yeah, or terminated the process. The process was terminated, but the decision to set up the councils uh, was uh, 
uh, valid, is still valid. So uh, Kiev uh, Obvious Council was uh, to announce the first elections, and it was not done. For some reason, we do not mention that, even though we actively discuss elections to Rayon Councils uh, where and there were some interests uh, there, but for the capital, somehow we um, keep quiet about that. I understand that there are political issues, but there are clear uh, uh, legal provisions that need to be complied with. So Kiev City Council, as of now, actually uh, has forgotten about that article of the election code 198. Speaking about that, well, Rayon Councils uh, in Kiev, well, then it was my initiative in CEC to appoint uh, elections in Kiev, and CEC made that decision then. And the judge, I will not mention the name, I could make a mistake there, they made the decision to terminate the decision or resolution on Ryan councils in Kiev. So that was postponed ever in court. And then there was the voting in Kyiv, and they voted for Kyiv City Council. And now it is still an outstanding issue. That's true. We don't know what to do there. Because the City Council could uh, support its decision or make a new decision, but they shouldn't keep silent like an ostrich. And because many of them also promised that there will be district councils in the city of Kyiv. Back in 2015, everybody promised that, but somehow they forgot about that. And uh, if I may, let me mention several questions from our audience. Mostly it is not about the difference between categories of elections, but some other aspects that are relevant for voters and those who plan to be, to be candidates. Question to Olga, until when the um, Settlement Council will function in the composition as it is now? Well, that's an interesting question, and it reveals uh, the poor quality of the legislative process. Look, uh, voluntary amalgamation of territorial communities is uh, clearly stipulated. So when the community is uh, considered to be established, when all local councils make the decision on amalgamation, and local council uh, uh, lost validity after the elections. And uh, when the new composition of uh, local council was elected for the amalgamated community. But now we have more questions than answers, because frankly speaking, territorial communities, uh, they were uh, created, uh, established in a forced way in 2020. And uh, you can ask anyone in the Minister of Regional Development or the uh, Parliamentary Committee, nobody will tell you uh, on which date uh, the new territorial communities were established. Nobody can answer that because the law doesn't offer an answer. And that gives uh, space for various uh, abuses, uh, for communal uh, property decisions, etc. So maybe that was there was some intention when the law was drafted. Another question rather about Rayon Councils from Serhii Mazarov. How will budgets of newly established Rayon Councils uh, we, will be uh, created? Sources of budgets. That is a question because the mandate, the authority of Rayon Councils have not yet been clarified. And it's not only about that the Ministry of Regional Development keep holding these discussions. And just yesterday, there was a discussion not only on budgets of Rayon Councils, but actually how to uh, support and maintain and the staff there. So that is a question. There are quite significant discussions and we discussed it here, whether uh, elections to Ryan councils will be announced according to the Constitution. Definitely, if you have questions, you need to go to the Constitution. And we can only dispute or discuss some indirect implications of that. So now there is no authority for Ryan councils, uh, no mandate. 
especially if we speak about liquidation of rayon councils. I would like to go back to the question of the Commission because I also have a question or information there. So, rayon election commissions, they are active and members of those commissions, they are members of other commissions now, of those positions. We also have those cases that need to be taken into account. And those rayon councils, for some time, they will also transfer communal property, municipal property, and there are no procedures stipulated for them. Alexander mentioned that the authorities of rayon councils or the mandates, they are depri being deprived of their uh, mandates. Because, but maybe that's good because Mr. Meghara mentioned that uh, uh, rayon councils uh, elected on the party basis actually do not ensure representation of communities. So they will not follow joint interests of the communities. They will follow interests of the parties and that uh, they have the majority. Of. And uh, that is uh, another question that is very concerning for the communities. So uh, the mandate and sources of funding of rayon councils, considering the fact that their party-based system is going to be applied, so it could be a, a party a ceiling for a local governments, I believe that that's a very relevant issue, and you need to be very cautious there and uh, attribute quite a lot of importance and significance to this issue uh, in autumn because they say everything will be fine and the uh, rayon councils will have sources of funding and those sources will not include the current sources of funding of territorial communities but what the final decision is in the legislative framework nobody knows that and what I know, as of now, is that uh, the uh, government promises to make the decision in autumn before the elections. If I may, another question that is most relevant for our questions, it is why there are no elections for um, seniors of villages? Well, maybe that's not a question to me. Uh, that is a question to me because I've commented on that. Well, there will be the uh, elections of uh, and the prefects for villages. Um, when making uh, amendments to uh, the draft law on amendments to ele uh, election legislation, they also amended the law on local governance. They withdrew Article uh, 14, where prefects are um, directly elected, but they added Article 51. Dot dot uh, 54.1 so what's going to happen and why it is not as bad as it might seem to some experts and to some citizens well if we kept it as it was then we would have uh, prefect elections now uh, so prefects would not be elected on the 25th though because this is first elections so you need to have your council you need to have the council operational. Then they established prefect districts and announced first elections. Until then, no prefects would be elected. We would waste time. So the legislator suggested that we save time to um, establish the Institute of Prefects. And uh, actually, after establishment of representative uh, um, body, uh, the prefect districts will be established, and after that, upon the application of the head, the council will approve the prefects and what the approval process is. If you go to Article 3 on, of the law on local governments, this is an, mm, uh, a position where people are elected for it. So this is not about direct elections. If it is good or bad, if we speak about the Institute of Prefects, the legislator wanted to uh, make uh, the relations between head of uh, council and the prefect more interactive. But uh, if we speak about the election system, well, that's a negative factor, but it's not about that the Institute of the Prefect that it's bad or that the initiative is bad about 
indirect elections. It is the problem of the proportional system at the level of village and settlement council. So prefix will work, and their mandate is not going to be limited. Again, Article 154.1. And the um, prefects remain members of executive committees. And uh, of course, limitation, there will be some limitations to representative mandate of the prefect. Thank you for reminding about that issue, because actually partisanization of elections uh, includes three components of the risk. Party lists, then party elections for rayon councils, then those prefects, because you know if you extrapolate the situ situation, you will see that the politically elected council will not approve anyone but for leaders of their party uh, offices or representative offices. So no matter who is submitted as a candidate, no one else will be approved. Um, uh, I believe there is the risk of that. And then the imperative mandate, which we didn't discuss today, but that's very important, that imperative mandate. Well, unfortunately, we have limited time to discuss that. But I just want you to take it into account that 45% of communities where there are 85% of voters based on CC data are going to vote uh, on the party list basis. And that is a very serious challenge to the entire local mm, governance system. And it, this institute of uh, uh, prefects, that's a component to that. Because if there were the proportional majority system and every village or, or settlement or city had a, a councillor, uh, uh, so then uh, as a representative, then we would discuss uh, prefects and if they need it. But since there is no representation and uh, uh, prefects uh, could also be uh, people who are not linked to that village or settlement. Then the question about how interests of every settlement are going to be represented at the level of local governance and at the level of the community, that causes those. So actually, these are components of that partization that we were very much against. Um, and uh, all communities are against those changes. Alexander, you wanted to add something to that? Yes, very briefly. This is how I see it. And I would recommend it to newly elected councils and uh, village and settlement heads. I would recommend that they organize public discussions when they suggest candidates for prefects so that it were a more a representative candidate to reduce, mitigate the influence of political parties on these decisions, on decisions of the city ahead. Это там будет такий десь баланс, зможуть це врегулювати між партизацією і саме от підтримкою громадян з російських кругах цього кандидата. Дякую. Олександр, обговорювати можна, а ви затверджувати буде рада. Так, але ж ви, пане Ігорю, якщо, якщо на публічних слуханнях або публічних обговореннях підтримує цього кандидата два-три села, я думаю, навряд чи е, будь-яка політична партія буде, ну, будуть, певно, але зменшаться ризики не затвердження цього кандидата. Це моя думка особиста. Пане Андрію. Тобто, старо, зверніть, будь ласка, увагу, що в нас передбачення за законом затвердження старост сіл і селищ, немає затвердження старост міст. Я не знаю, чи це добре чи погано, але погано однозначно те, що жителі міст позбавлені права на місцеве самоврядування. Не всі міста мають право на місцеве самоврядування. Місто Угнів у складі Белської міської громади Львівської області Місто Соснівка в складі Червоноградської міської ради Львівської області, навіть за радянських часів, за комуністичних часів, навіть попри те, що місцеві ради були одержавлені великою мірою, навіть тоді існували представницькі органи жителів кожного міста. Зараз цього немає. Це теж дуже велика проблема. 
Андрій Йосипович, ви абсолютно праві, і законодавець вас так оперативно почув, що вже вніс законопроект 3971. Це нові, до речі, зміни до виборчого законодавства, і в тому числі не тільки до виборчого кодексу, а й до закону про місцеве самоврядування. Якщо ми будемо говорити, то будемо говорити окремо про це, а якщо ні, то дасте мені три хвилинки. Я пропоную вже говорити одразу те, що ми хочеться говорити, тому що ми вже підходимо до завершення, і, власне, всіх запрошую теж подумати над підсумковими ремарками. Тому кілька слів про ці зміни, зокрема зміни, про які акцентує увагу Андрій Йосипович. Це зміни до закону про місцеве самоврядування, в тому числі і в преамбулі вносяться зміни до визначення старостинського округу. Definition of prefect districts. So prefect districts and prefects of villages settlements and cities are stipulated. So there will be equal conditions for all settlements. And also, uh, Article 1791 will be withdrawn. This is about early termination of the mandate of prefix. You no longer need that because there will be a different system to elect prefix. And sure, amendments to Article 5, uh, going back to Rayon Oblast Councils, uh, um, having them back in the system of local governments uh, and if we speak about 3971 draft law as a new initiative to uh, amend to change some election procedures, well, this draft law has been registered. Whether it will be quickly um, and discussed and when it will be submitted to the parliament, that's a question to the MPs. That's a different question, but we need that uh, draft law because uh, it was uh, prepared, the previous draft was prepared very quickly. There are technical emissions that need to be uh, amended in order to ensure a quality process. Mostly these are technical omissions or some discrepancies, but another positive change is uh, uh, excluding from the list of documents submissions uh, uh, of uh, mm, uh, documents confirming that there is no criminal record and there is no uh, there are no uh, that's for alumnus outstanding alumnus well that was applied to the majority system but for proportional system we still have that so to ensure equality of the election right t these technical changes are necessary also there are some changes to liberalize accounting of voices in the part of the bulletins, meaning the legislator uh, suggests to the election commission if it is possible to take that figure into account um, it is left upon the disc discretion of the commission. If they vote for a party, but the number is of another candidate, then the legislator suggests that the voting for the party uh, is uh, dominates. If there is only one uh, tick for the candidate, but not for the party, that should be uh, interpreted as supporting the entire list. Again, if uh, there is only one uh, tick instead of the number for the candidate, then it is voting for the list. It's, uh, I mean, the legislator tries to prevent that negative practice of uh, um, invalid uh, bulletins of voting cards where it is too difficult for the voters to properly understand the system. There are some um, comments uh, from the expert uh, uh, department that uh, these assumptions uh, do not confirm the fact of voting and uh, MPs need to now MPs need to decide whether they follow this opinion or they uh, do as intended to avoid those huge numbers of invalid bulletins. Then the legislator uh, doesn't clarify in the current election code the situation where an MP is elected from two councils. We know about the procedure of 
parallel uh, submission of candidates, uh, uh, but uh, what to do if uh, someone receives two mandates. So in this case, this candidate needs to uh, go to the Territorial Election Commission to register him or her as a councillor, a member of only one local council. So the individual would have to opt for one mandate. But sure, we need procedures on how the commissions are going to communicate and if there will be cases of abuse where people have two mandates. So I believe there may be some issues there after elections. Also, they make amendments they withdraw provisions on special establishment of election districts for the city of Kiev. That was in final provisions. That was a huge problem for Kiev as a city, where for some reason the legislator stipulates an individual provision. But if these amendments are adopted in Kiev, they will follow the general rules. Also, they clarify aspects of double and uh, simultaneous submission of candidates. That is about clarification of names of districts. There were questions about uh, multi-member or uh, districts, and that's important. These are, te these are technical things, but important for quality election process. And also, speaking about the amendments, amendments to Article 157 of the Election Code, limiting branded products, not more than 3% of living, uh, of subsistence level. And while the current provision is 6% uh, uh, of uh, non-taxed uh, minimal uh, income, but that went counter to the tax code. And a number of other amendments, but now we don't have enough time to focus on all of them. Maybe some other colleagues would like to suggest uh, to, to comment on that. I'm grateful to Olena because she facilitated, she made it easier for us. She has listed everything that needs to be changed, actually. For us, a sensitive issue is priority of uh, rayon party organizations to register the lists to local uh, councils if a city is a part of a rayon. For example, Lviv rayon party organization of any political party and dominates over a Lviv city party organization where they submit lists to Lviv uh, local council. And uh, we understand that this ambiguity is due to the new territorial structure and due to the fact that uh, here party organizations don't have enough time to re-register based on the new number of rayons. So we have duplication of power there. So it is important to politically uh, to, for the parties to politically uh, decide on that. For example, if there are several um, organizations within the same uh, rayon which are not liquidated, they need to decide on the priority. Yeah, so the, that should be the discretion of the parties to avoid chaos. But in this amendment, we see it as illogical because to uh, city uh, when submitting to city council, a rayon organization dominates, even though formally that's territorial decision. If that amendment is made, then it is in formal territorial decision. So parties will need to find some consensus, uh, otherwise there would be a problem. And Article 57 about non-taxed uh, minimal wages, that's very important because that was actually a mistake. They just copied, pasted that from amendments to the criminal code where and there is a different formula to calculate that. That was half of minimal wages, 50% of minimal wages. 1,051 grivnias, 60% from that it is 60 something grivnias, while in other documents and codes it is 17 grivnias. So this amendment needs to be made to improve, to correct the situation because otherwise parties will not have the uh, capacity to, uh, to, to promote themselves because uh, that may be seen as bribery. 
I believe that that's another sign of low quality of the materials that are adopted by the parliament as laws. Because it is obvious that when first uh, local elections take place, it is hardly possible to expect that local uh, party organizations will be extended. But if the state kind of raped everyone, providing the parties with this monop monopoly right to submit their uh, candidates to uh, local governments, it is rather surprising that uh, oblast organizations uh, have the right to s s propose candidates for all levels and for all councils. That's okay for uh, the first elections, but then it should be included into res uh, the respective section. Their um, oblast party organizations could uh, suggest their candidates, but for um, planned, unplanned early other elections, there should be the respective level, rayon to rayon, uh, city to city. Because otherwise, it is a motivation for the parties that would be set up tomorrow out of the blue, without any grassroots organizations, uh, but for uh, oblast ones. We have a question from our audience. So which uh, bulletin should be considered invalid in line with the new amendments and suggestions? Let's wait for adoption of amendments to the election code, because the chief expert department stipulates that there are these omissions and that changes should be made in the article on invalid bulletins as well, because they, there are contradictions. So I believe that there will be some working group, or maybe they will adopt that in the first uh, um, reading, uh, at least uh, it should be suggested uh, in the parliamentary hall. If I may, just one more minute, that's an important question that the parliament will not resolve that because the deadline for the procedure for appeals of NGOs uh, it is uh, five, 50 days before the voting election day. The parliament will vote uh, on the 3rd of uh, September or later, so even if there is this amendment, it will not be made. In the working group, there was an, an, a, a strong recommendation from uh, organizations like us that observe elections that had of organization um, approves the statute. But uh, the uh, amendment for Article 60 is such that the notary needs to notarize the statute of an NGO for them to submit it with other documents to CC. And that's a problem because de facto, if uh, according to the law, none of organizations in Ukraine will be able to uh, act as observer as uh, at elections unless CEC explains the procedure as it was done for rayon organizations of political parties, etc. And the problem is that the Ministry of Justice no longer uh, approve statutes uh, uh, as amended, and uh, so the organizations cannot go to notaries with them. That is done in electronically in the registry, and the Ministry of Justice actually has an electronic copy with amendments. But when an NGO comes to a notary, they cannot bring a paper copy because the original of the statute uh, uh, registered by the Minister of Justice doesn't exist. So now of NGOs uh, is able to act as observer at elections and use these rights, if it is suggested and implemented in that way. And again, I don't see that as abuse. I just believe that those people who mm, uh, drafted the law didn't have that understanding, because above all, that's about additional expenditures, uh, costs for the organization. And if there is the need to submit to observe in a particular reg region, um, then it's about national organizations. And that makes no sense, but that is a significant uh, barrier for CSOs to act as observers at elections, while that is one of international standards of fair, free, and democratic elections, right to observance, 
um, by non-party structures uh, as stipulated in the Copenhagen document uh, and that may be violated unless uh, the CSOs can submit their statutes that are registered in another way because paper versions for many years have not been available. Now, dear speakers, let's come up with final recommendations, comments, something else that voters and candidates should keep an eye on. CEC publishes on their website information about changes of election addresses, not only by regions of Ukraine, like where voters go, but per community, small or large communities. This information is made public so that the public, the civil society, law enforcement agencies could monitor that information and maybe in some election districts or polling stations, it will be necessary to intensify observation process. This is a new mechanism applied for the first time, so in that way it will be possible to prevent violations. I have a lot of apprehensions, I say a lot of risks on the election day, but one of the greatest concerns, this is about the bulletin and about work of uh, district commissions. They wanted to improve the bulletins, but they made it worse because they didn't take it into account that unfortunately people die or they may change their citizenship or there may be mm, court rulings deeming them, uh, depriving them of their voting rights. So that may result in a lot of problems uh, and there may be a lot of appeals to court. There was an okay uh, bulletin the proportional system and there are information postcards for that and everything could be uh, insured there but we for some reason that was not used for district commissions uh, several months ago we discussed it with the experts how district commissions what will they do about two election bulletins at the same time under the new election system it is quite challenging and co sophisticated Above all, that's about uh, uh, local uh, oblast centers, but uh, the parliament made it even worse and they uh, produced three bulletins instead of two. So you understand that above all, that is about calculation per party, then per candidate. And so there was the idea, some ideas about alternative compositions of the commission on the day or night where they count the votes. The maximum number of commission mem members is 18. It used to be 24, but we tend to, uh, to streamline, to save funds from the budget. And now imagine there's 18 members who support the voting process, organize the voting process, and then they need to count the votes. And you see why the legislator sets 12 days to uh, announce the results of elections. Because the uh, district commissions will take long to implement that, to, to complete this process. So that's a challenge. So it is important to think about increasing the number of maximum number of uh, district commissions and about alternatives. Uh, for that. And uh, that is a significant problem. There are a lot of problems in the election process, but I believe that this is now a problem that we neglect and we ignore, but it is significant. Anyone else? Not to go into detail. Well, since we are an association, we are going to speak about more general things. Let me reiterate that parliamentary parties, when they change the system and rules uh, without uh, following the opinion or taking into account uh, uh, opinion of experts or local government, that was a nasty surprise. 
but uh, local governments are going to respond to that, uh, creating uh, own political formats at the national level, like proposit uh, proposition party, and at the regional level, like the platform of communities in Ivano-Frankivsk and many other regions. So eventually, I believe that in autumn, local governance, governments will not become weaker or more obedient. They will become even stronger and more independent, which was the objective of the decentralization reform, to set up the communities with a strong and independent local governance. It will be more difficult to achieve that uh, unless uh, with these changes that have happened, but I believe that that will happen. And then we will insist on uh, withdrawal of the imperative mandate and because it is postponed uh, for one year. And Mr. Slobozhan yesterday mentioned that uh, as the executive director of the Association of Cities. And we will insist on withdrawal of other distortions that this summer were introduced into the legislative legislation. And in this way, we will mitigate negative consequences of those changes for the communities, for people in the communities, so that local governments depended not on central authorities, not on the parties, but on people who are uh, who are candidates for local governments and for self-regulation. I just wish all of us patience, wisdom, courage for all of those who dare to participate in these elections. That is definitely a heroic deed because election uh, code is very um, complex and the deadlines are very short. Uh, awareness raising component is lacking. So everybody, all the stakeholders, uh, ECC, I address to Olga, well, Thank you for your, your information. Awareness raising publications on Facebook, on various aspects of the election process, but that's not enough, and voters still don't uh, see clearly how they are going to vote. So at the national level, information and awareness raising policy is important for voters. Uh, uh, follow amendments to the legislation, the website of CEC, sometimes there are radical changes. For example, on the 18th of August, the CEC made the decision to withdraw from the list of communities where first elections were announced, uh, Sokolivska community in Cherkasy region based on the respective applications. Uh, so these changes are very important and us as voters, we need to know to be aware of them. So the information policy is very important. If no one else wants to speak now, let me express gratitude to everybody who stayed with us and thanks to the speakers for all uh, for the very rich discussion you will our audience will have a chance to see the summary of this discussion on the website of uh, Dobra program and of crisis media center you can also go back to the broadcast uh, on facebook page of uh, Dobra and crisis media center and decentralization page uh, so be healthy, stay safe. Goodbye.